understand them in a sense that Ar-Rahman means the most merciful. And this is why the word Rahman in Arabic is on the same rhyme of Ghadban. And Ghadban means full of rage and anger. So Rahman also means full of mercy and compassion. And it is stronger than Ar-Rahim which means the bestower of mercy, the giver of mercy. And both names are stemmed from the beautiful attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal, which is mercy, ar-Rahmah. And this is one of the attributes that are strongly found in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And all people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah agree that Allah Azza wa Jal has this attribute in Him. Unlike the deviant sects and cults who do not approve of Allah's being uh, 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 described with such a beautiful attribute, on the account that it means weakness and softness, and Allah cannot be like this. And this shows you how deviant they are when they compare Allah Azza wa to his servants. We never compare Allah's beautiful attributes to any other than him. Because there is nothing like unto him. Nothing similar to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we say that Allah is all living, ever living, we cannot deny this and say, yeah, but all those who live must die. This is not possible with Allah. This is why so many deviant sects and cults went astray. When they followed their whims and desires, rather than following the Sharia, rather, rather than following the law of Allah Azza wa Jal, rather than following the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and his great companions. So Allah is merciful. Allah Azza wa Jal is described with mercy. So what's the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? And by the way, this is a lot of people make the same mistake. Do we say Ar-Rahman or Al-Rahman? In Arabic language, the identification article Al is divided into two types, Shamsiyya and Qamariyya. Al-Shams, if you notice, we don't say Al-Shams. Rather, we delete the Al and we merge it with the following letter, so, uh, letter with emphasis on it. So we do not say Al-Shams. Rather, we say Ash-Shams. With Qamar, we say Al-Qamar. The L is present and noticeable. So this is how they call it, Al-Shamsiyya or Al-Qamariyya, so that you can know when to pronounce the L and when to merge it. In Ar-Rahman, it is Ash-Shamsiyya. We don't say Al-Rahman. Al-Rahim, we say Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. We merge it and we put the emphasis on the R. So what is the difference between these two beautiful names? Some say that Ar-Rahman means that he's the one with the vast, great mercy that encompasses all creatures in this universe, while Ar-Rahim is specific for the believers. Evidence, they say Allah says in the Quran, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, the most merciful who is above the throne established or rose over his throne. What does that mean? It means that the throne is the highest thing in this universe. It's the greatest creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
and Allah described himself to be Ar-Rahman who was established over the throne or who rose over the throne which means that his mercy covers all this universe and in the other name which is Ar-Rahim Allah says وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا and never is he to the believers merciful so this is specific and limited to the believers this is what the majority of scholars say but this is countered by another ayah where Allah says إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Indeed Allah is to the people kind and merciful Rahim so not only limited to the believers but to all how to combine between these two opinions this is one opinion Ar-Rahman is for all and the Rahim is only for the believers. The second opinion is the most authentic, which was chosen by a number of scholars like Ibn Uthameen, Ibn Al Qayyim, etc. That Ar Rahman is a description of Allah Azza wa Jal. And what we call Sifatun Dhatiya. It is an attribute that describes the essence, Allah Himself. While Ar-Rahim describes his actions, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is related to the creations. While Ar-Rahman, it is related to the creator himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's mercy would require us to talk endlessly for many, many episodes. And this is a luxury we cannot afford Allah's mercy when sought after you will always get it because this is the essence of Allah Azza wa Jal's attributes that he is most merciful Ibrahim peace be upon him found it when he was thrown in the inferno in the fire they built to kill him Yusuf peace be upon him found it when he was left in an abandoned well when he was young and when he was thrown unjustly in jail for a number of years due to his chastity Ismail and his mother peace be upon them found it in the wilderness in the desert where there is no plant and no water Yunus peace be upon him found it in the belly of the whale that swallowed him Musa peace be upon him found it as a child when his mother threw him in the river and he found it in the mansion and palace of Pharaoh when he grew up under the eyes of Pharaoh the youth in the cave found Allah's mercy in the cave which they could not find in their palaces and homes and the Prophet والسلام, found the same mercy when he was with his companion in the cave afraid of being caught by those who were pursuing them the name Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is widely spread in the Quran and in the Sunnah it is sufficient for us to contemplate on these names when we recite the Fatiha when we acknowledge Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim When we say these beautiful names and call upon Allah Azza wa Jal we feel what they mean now so that we seek His mercy whenever it is possible to do so The third name we are to discuss today insha'Allah is also a name found in the Quran and in the Sunnah so <clears throat> the name Al-Malik which means the king the sovereign the ruler it is found in the Quran and the Sunnah in three forms Al-Malik 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 all of these three are names of Allah Azza wa Jal, with slight difference. So 
the Malik, we find that in Surah Al-Hashr, Ayah 59, uh, Surah 59, verse 23. And the rest. So the first one is Al-Malik. And Al-Malik, we find it in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 26. قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَاءُ As for Al-Malik, it came only once in the Qur'an. In Surah Al-Qamar, chapter 54, verse 54-55. إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَنَهَرٍ فِي مَقْعَدِ صِدْقٍ عِنْدَ مَلِيكٍ مُقْتَدِرٍ so Malik is one of Allah Azza wa Jal's beautiful names. What is the difference? Scholars say that Al-Malik, like a rahman it's a description of the essence of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's a description of Allah Himself. Where Al-Malik is a description of Allah's actions and giving away. Al-Malik is a combination of the two. And this is the choice of Imam Ash-Shawkani. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Now, when we come to this beautiful name, Al-Malik, we will find that there are a number of things that needs contemplating. For example, when we recite Surat An-Nas, we recite it every single day. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ this is Surah Al-Falaq, what comes afterwards. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Listen, Rabb al-Nas, the Lord of the people. Malik al-Nas, the King of the people. Ilah al-Nas, Allah, the, the, the Lord of Allah, the, the, the people, the God of the people. Three beautiful names, Rabb, Malik, Ilah. Now what is mind-blowing is that you're seeking in three of Allah's beautiful names, seeking refuge from shaitan. And if you look at these attributes, you will find that he is the Lord truly, and he is the king truly, and he is the God truly. He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rabb, the Lord that nurtures them. He is the Lord and the Master. He is the capable. He is the creator. He is the giver of uh, 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 image. He is the all-living, the self-sustaining, the knowledgeable, the all-hearing, the all-seeing. He is the Lord, the one who gives life and takes it. And then when you go to the Malik, Malik al-Nas, you'll find that he's the one who gives orders and prohibits things. He's the one who honors and humiliates. He's the one who uplifts people and puts them down. He is the one who facilitates things to his servants as they wish. And when you go to Ilah nas you'll find that all beautiful names and attributes are related to this name. So he's the only one worthy of being worshipped. These three magnificent names and three majestic names Meanings, people go by without noticing it. And this is why we have to address that the owner of sovereignty, Malikul Mulk, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is Allah Azza wa Jal. He has all beautiful names and attributes of perfection that no one can ever claim. If you compare Allah Azza wa Jal's sovereignty with others, if you compare Allah's kinship, kingship with others, you'll find that people's kingship is reduced drastically and would run off when they spend because they don't possess anything. While Allah's reign and Allah's sovereignty and Allah's wealth is not reduced by a single thing. You will find that servants of Allah one day 
will lose all their wealth, their power and their authority, either by death or by illness, or someone snatches their kingship away from them while Allah Azza wa Jal is ever living, never dies, and his reign will never perish. Allah Azza wa Jal is, in essence, a king, a ruler, a master, a lord, while servants of God, servants of Allah, need someone to hand them such authority to make them kings, and usually such kings beg people's allegiance through money or through intimidation uh, uh, and through their power. The only one who gives and takes such kingship is Allah Azza wa Jal. He is the only one who has such sovereignty and he's the owner of such sovereignty. And if we contemplate when we recite the Fatiha, when saying, Maliki Yawmiddin, the sovereign owner of the day of judgment, where no one ever claims that he's an owner. So by default, he is the sovereign owner of everything that is on earth before the day of judgment. If we manage to understand and contemplate about, uh, upon these beautiful names of Allah Azza wa Jal, our prayers would definitely have a difference. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the Ummah of his virtues, no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. Among the benefits of this narration, it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them, is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, Albani ruled it authentic in his book Sahih Al-Jami'. The explanation of As-Sindi on the book of Ibn Majah and At-Taysir Bisharh Al-Jami' As-Saghir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Adam from the US. Adam? Okay, sad man from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. 
Yeah, my question is, why is Sheikh Rabi bin Hadi al Makhali controversial? I have heard that Sheikh Albani bin Baz and Usaymin praised him. Okay. And we have Suhail from Malaysia. Suhail. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Um, so I, I, I believe, alhamdulillah, that uh, free mixing is haram, and I believe, alhamdulillah, and uh, I remember you you making a lot of videos on regards to the example of the Prophet's masjid, that the best rose of men is the first, and the uh, best rose of women is the last. So this is one of the good evidence about free mixing. But then sometimes, some people come and tell us that, look, I will be like, may Allah guide them, but then they say, look, the Prophet وسلم, his marriage to Khadija, Khadija saw him, and then they, they say that, oh, look, there are lots of hadith where the Prophet وسلم, was with Ummu Sulaim. So, Sheikh, can you just shed some light here? Inshallah. Okay, I will, Inshallah. Um, Abu Hafs from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Yes, Sheikh, uh, my question is uh, that uh, our Imam. Uh, our Imam prays the Witr prayer according to the Hanafi Madhab. So, uh, if I pray in congregation with him uh, at the time of, uh, well, uh, the time when he prays Qunut, uh, should I hold my hands as they hold in, in the Hanafi Madhab, following the Imam, or should I raise my hands as we raise while making dua generally? Okay, I will answer inshallah. Uh, Ahmed from the UK. Ahmed from the UK. Taha from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam. This is Taha? Yes, yes, I'm Taha. Yes, sir. So, so Sheikh, I want to know the actual uh, rakat. Hazrat uh, Umar commanded Tamim al Dari and Ubay ibn Kaab to lead the Tarawi. Okay. Sheikh, Sheikh. And we have. Noah from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you doing? Salamatullah. Hayyak Allah. MashaAllah. Sheikh, my question is um, uh, uh, regarding uh, greeting parents. B regarding if, example, what? I walk into a room. Re regarding greeting what? Greeting parents. Parents. Okay. Parents. Yes. Okay. Like, for example, I walk into a room and I see my mother, for example, she's lying down on, the, on her bed, for example. Do I... To, do I sit down to greet her? Someone said that is not correct. Or if vice versa, for example, she walks into a room and I'm lying down, maybe playing game, can I, is it okay for me to greet her as I am or do I have to stand up to greet her? And same thing, Yashik, in the office, for example, we are told that, for example, if your boss walks into the office, you have to stand up to greet him. So is it okay to do such things or? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Muhammad from the US. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Sheikh, uh, my question is, uh, when we uh, start memorizing the Quran, uh, is it uh, mandatory to uh, memorize it with the Tajweed? Uh, so while we'll be reciting the Quran without the Tajweed rules, without maintaining like point to prolong, point okay. to stop? Okay, I will, I will answer you, inshallah, Muhammad. Taymour from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, usually after Fajr prayer, I, I um, go to sleep. So do I have to recite Surah Mulk again? Okay, I will answer you. Insha'Allah. Um, Rifat from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu Okay, my question is about uh, also answer. And every time I uh, pray, yeah, every time I perform my gosol, for gosol, every time I am in also answer. And since last night, I yeah, till now I have performed my for gosol fifth five, five times. But every time I fell in also answer. And is it what is oswata? To... Wait, 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 wait. What is oswata? Oswata, sorry, sorry, Shaykh. What is it? Actually, actually, I I am in doubt that uh, water didn't enter my beard. Uh, actually, I mean, <laughs> I'm in doubt. 
if, if you're in doubt, how do, what do I do to you? This is not logical. You perform ghusl five times and you say that there is uswata. I don't know what uswata is. It's Botswana in Africa or it, it has nothing to do. If you stand under the shower, you take a good shower, that's it. It takes you three to five minutes maximum. No, no. My question is actually, is it mandatory to enter water into the yeah, nail during for kusul? To your nails? Nails, yes. Okay, I will answer inshallah. We have Yahya from uh, the U.S., I think. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Awesome. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah, Sheikh Yahya. Um, I was, one, one day I was sitting in a corner where there was half shade, half sun, and my teacher told me I can't sit there. And when I asked why, he said, because that's shaitan's spot and it's haram to sit in that place. Can okay. you please elaborate on that? I will, inshallah. Um... Ahmed from the UK? I don't know. Is it Ahmed from the UK? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum Um, Sheikh, um, I've called you a while back regarding um, a situation I was in with the, I don't know if you remember, with regarding the waterproof uh, cream that I wasn't able to take off. Um, so I was told to do Taymu. Okay. But now um, I have Opinion, um, different opinion, um, different people saying to me, like pharmacists saying the, 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 the waterproof, it's not waterproof, and the water can penetrate your skin. But then um, the senior doctor said um, that it is waterproof, and the water doesn't penetrate your skin. Now I'm confused, like, what, what do I do? Do I perform time on the door or? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Um, I think we will stop here and try to answer whatever questions we have. Sadman from Bangladesh is asking about Sheikh Rabir al-Madkhali, which is very, very inappropriate to do. It is impolite. It is inappropriate for someone to ask someone like me on live television about a well-renowned known Sheikh. Whether we agree with what he says or not, it is inappropriate. It is out of etiquette, manner, ethics. Where is the respect of scholars when you come and ask a question like this? So this is what I always tell people. Be, uh, um, I wouldn't use the word, yeah, maybe polite. Be polite, be wise in the questions you ask. Don't ask a sheikh and say to him, uh, sheikh so-and-so says something and you say against it. What's the ruling on that? Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, may Allah have mercy on his soul, used to be furious when someone asks him like this. And he says, if you ask someone else, why come and ask me? And if you know who Sheikh Rabir is, why do you come and ask people like me? He's a well-renowned scholar. He has his contribution. He was praised by Sheikh Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Al-Albani. And also he has his own flaws and shortcomings like everybody else. So it is inappropriate totally to ask such a question, but unfortunately, there are people with illnesses in their hearts that they frequently try to hit few birds with one stone. So if they can score a point here and score a point there, tarnish the reputation of this one or of that one, label this person of being Hizbi or this person of being Murji or being Khawarij or being etc. They like to play such a dirty, filthy game, which is totally inappropriate for a Muslim who does not have a hidden agenda, who does not play politics like many people do. May Allah protect us. So Hail from Malaysia has a confusion between free mixing and some what the layman say, Akhi, if you gonna give your ear to every Tom, Dick and Harry, they're gonna confuse you. And instead of learning Quran and Sunnah, you'll end up looking in the sources and the origin and how to counter uh, uh, attack their allegations. This is not what Allah created us for. We know the ruling. Free mixing is prohibited. This is a given. Now, when it comes to allegations like the one you have thrown, Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, 
The Prophet ﷺ and Khadija got married before Islam by approximately 15 years. So you're going to hold him or her accountable for something that was not revealed to the Prophet Islam. Islam was not there yet. Don't, don't we have any minds to think of? Firstly. Secondly, show me the proof that she went on to see the Prophet and to mix with him. All of this is nonsense. He used to work for her. And there were mediators who would tell him to do what she instructed them to tell him. Not that they were free mixing or sitting alone for long hours, etc. All of these are not, this is nonsense. As for Umm Sulaim, Umm Sulaim, the mother of Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with her. Ibn Hajar said this, and he countered attack all of these allegations by saying Umm Sulaim and Umm Haram, they are sisters, and their only brother Haram ibn Malhan, may Allah uh, be pleased with him, who was martyred, uh, they were uncles of the Prophet through, uh, through uh, uh, suckling. So they were mahram to the Prophet This is why the Prophet used to spend afternoons uh, napping or si having his siesta in the house of Umm Sulaim. And she used to collect the sweat coming from his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of this is well known. So when you listen to doubters who cast doubts, try to confuse you, if you give them an ear, you lose your faith. Not because your faith is fragile, because your knowledge is fragile. You don't have knowledge at all. Therefore, focus, Akhi, to listening only to those who are trusted, whom you will learn Quran and Sunnah from and get you closer to Allah. Don't go fatwa shopping here and there listening to such doubts. Abu Hafs says, if I pray behind a Hanafi Imam, what should I do? Pray exactly like he does. He follows a trusted school of thought. And to the best of his knowledge, this is the right thing to do. So you follow what uh, um, he does. If he does qunut before ruku', do it. If he raises his hands, do it. Uh, if he prays witr like maghrib, which we are not supposed to do, no problem in doing that, inshallah. Taha from India says, uh, he would like to know how many rak'ahs did Tamim al-Dari and Ubay ibn Ka'b lead the prayers uh, in Taraweeh because we know that Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, gathered all the Muslims to pray behind these two Imams. This is an issue of dispute depending on how authenticates the Hadith, whether they prayed 23 rak'ahs or they prayed 11. And there is no point in going into such dispute, whatever you choose to do, 11 is good, 23 is good, 51 is good, whatever. You, you want to pray, the sky is the limit. The Prophet never limited it to 11. Don't be confused. Nowhere that the Prophet came and say, do not pray more than 11. Yes, the Prophet did pray 11 rakahs, but he did it limited. The Prophet only performed hajj once in his life, but he didn't limited. So no one can come and say, no, 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 I'll pray, I'll offer one hajj. That's it, because the Prophet, Prophet Hassan offered one hajj. No. If it was a sunnah to be, uh, um, uh, to get hold on to, the Prophet would have hinted when the man said, how should I pray night prayer? The Prophet said, two, two. And if you fear fajr, then give or offer one rak'ah uh, uh, of witr. He never told him to two, but do not exceed 11. And Allah knows best. Nuh from Nigeria, how should we greet the parents? Some people uh, say that if they were lying down, we cannot sit. We have to do it standing up. All of these things are cultural. It has nothing to do with Islam. As long as you show your respect, this is sufficient. Don't do anything that is haram, such as squatting or bowing or prostrating, etc. This is haram. But at the same time, it's up to the customs. If it's in the customs that you greet your parents while standing up, no problem in doing that. As for the boss, when he comes in, or the ruler, or whatever, and people stand up, this is, again, according to the custom, but the prohibition is in the heart of the person walking in. For example, I walk in a room where there are people sitting down, 
I say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. They say alaikum assalam. And no one stands. If I feel agitated or I feel humiliated, then this is a major sin that may put me in hell. Because the Prophet said, whoever likes people to stand up when they see, when they, uh, see him, then he should assume his seat in hellfire. This is a sign of arrogance. So this is not permissible for me. Now, if I see while sitting down someone I haven't seen for a while, and I stand up for him, to greet him, to embrace him, there's nothing wrong in that. However, it's again according to the customs. Some countries don't know the Sunnah. So if you don't stand up to the one coming in, that would be an insult. So you stand just to avoid problems. But if he knows the Sunnah, and you know that he knows the Sunnah, no, you don't stand up. He comes to you, you shake hands while sitting down. There's no problem in that, and Allah knows best. Muhammad from the US, do we have to recite Tajweed when we memorize the Quran? The answer is no. Tajweed is a beautiful science that beautifies your recitation. So when you recite inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilafi al-layli wan nahar this is tajweed but if i recite it inna fi inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilafi al-layli wan nahar the the words are clear it's arabic it's audible it's uh, understood and comprehended there's nothing wrong in that would it be a plus to learn tajweed yes but it is not mandatory your prayer is valid your memorization is valid I would highly suggest that you memorize the Quran with Tajweed. Because if you fail to do this and later on, a few years down the line, you try to pick up Tajweed, it's going to be difficult to teach an old dog new tricks, as they say. Taymur from the UK, he says, if I were to sleep after Fajr, should I recite the adhkar of bedtime? If you slept at night and you read Surah Al-Mulk and the Athkar and you wiped your body with the three quls, etc. And you woke up before Fajr, you prayed Fajr and went back to sleep, you don't have to repeat that. But if you did not sleep the whole night and you prayed Fajr and you went to bed, now you have to read it. Rifat says that he has a problem with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And a lot of the Muslims who start to practice, who start to learn about their religion, shaitan attacks them through OCD. Those who are negligent, who don't know where the qibla is, who don't know what ghusl is, he doesn't even care to bother them. He just focuses on throwing desires and lusts and sins on them. So whoever starts to practice gets these whispers, gets these intrusive thoughts and gets these whispers regarding purity. So they perform ghusl five times. Islam is a religion of simplicity. It's a religion that is good for a rocket scientist and for a shepherd. So it is not something complicated. The way you're doing it is not part of Islam. Taking ghusl is to just simply cover your uh, a whole body in water, turning the water in your mouth and sniffing up your nostrils and blowing it, blowing it up, of course, with your left hand. The issue is that people, when they don't have knowledge, they start thinking about the details, and as they say, the devil is in the details. So they say, okay, so what about the area underneath my nails? What about... Um, uh, this or that, all of this is not mentioned. Nobody says ever in wudu or in ghusl that you have to go under your nails and wash it and clean it. And what counts is what's on the surface. Some people have old skin. So they say, Sheikh, should we peel it off? And maybe this would cause some wounds in order for the water to reach underneath. Who says that the water has to reach underneath? It's only their whims and desires. If they were to follow Sharia, they would not have a, had any problems. Yahya, from the US, he says, I was sitting once 
and I was half in the shade and half in the sun. So my teacher told me that I shouldn't do that. When I asked for the reason, he said, because this is where shaitan sits. So he uh, is asking me, can you elaborate? Yeah, I can easily elaborate. This is what the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam. There are so many things, Yahya, that we believe without understanding because this is part of our religion. Allah described us in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah that we believe in the unseen. So if I were to tell you that, Akhi, here is a mine gold. You said, wait, I, I can't see anything. You will not believe me. But when Allah tells us that there are angels around us, there are jinn around us, there is heaven and hell with so many things in them, there is torment in the grave, we say, we believe. People say, believe in what? Are you crazy? Can you see anything? No, but I can believe and relate because I believe in the Quran. I believe in Muhammad alayhi salatu our messenger, and I believe in the existence of Allah. So anything else is by default. Therefore, when we wake up, we sniff water up our nostrils, nostrils three times and blow it out. Why? The Prophet tells us because Satan or the devil sleeps over our nostrils. Did you see that? No, but you believe it and do it. Those who oversleep and not pray Fajr on time, Satan urinates in their ears. Have you felt the urine? So, no, I haven't seen Satan to, be, to, to feel his urine. Likewise, when you wear one pair of shoes and walk barefooted with the other foot, this is the way that shaitan walks. I haven't seen the shaitan, but the prophet told me this and I believe in it. This is the dividing line between believers and disbelievers. So we believe when the prophet tells us, do not sit in the middle of the shade where half of you is in shade and the other is the sun because this is where shaitan sits. We say, Sami'na wa ata'na. We hear and adhere and obey because this is what the Prophet told us and Allah knows best. Finally, Ahmed from the UK, he says, I am confused. Well, my friend, this makes two of us. How would I know? If the pharmacist tell, tell you, tells you that this is not waterproof, while the doctor tells you it is waterproof and it will prevent water from reaching the skin, who am I to know, Akhi? I'm not a pharmacist, <laughs> I'm not a, a physician. This is something that you have to do your due diligence and to be safe rather than sorry, make sure that the water reaches the skin. If you feel it does not reach the skin, then you have to perform tayammum for the areas that was uh, uh, not reached by the water and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have and until we meet tomorrow same time, I leave you for Allah. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ولله الأسماء الحسنى فادعوه بها وذروا الذين يلحدون في أسمائه سيجزون ما كانوا يعملون